that said, hello, my name is John. I'm an applied machine learning intern on the AI engineering team, and I'm going to be talking about privacy enhancing technologies bootcamp and some of my contributions. As we probably all know, with the advent of big data, we have a ton of private information in the digital world that we want to keep safe, but also leverage in a meaningful way. So privacy, privacy enhancing technologies are a set of tools that allow us to store, process, and distribute data in a privacy preserving manner. So it's an emerging area of research, uh, lots of tools and new methods being proposed all of the time. And um, I think I've, as, as we saw like a lot of interest from the industry side as well in these techniques. So in particular, I worked on two demos that, like I said, were in the form of notebooks um, but I'll just go over them um, at a high level in this presentation. The first one is vertical federated learning, and the second one is in a differential privacy using a method called PATE. Uh, so for vertical federated learning, we know that data often exists in silos. This can be the case uh, within an organization or across multiple organizations. Uh, in each case, uh, we would benefit from having a more complete feature set and, and sharing that data, but privacy restrictions uh, prevent us from doing so. So inspired by this limitation, vertical federated learning was introduced and involves uh, training a joint model across um, where the features are partitioned across multiple data sets um, without having to explicitly exchange those features among the parties. So the data set that we chose for this demo was the home credit default data set, uh, where the features are features about uh, a credit applicant and the label is whether or not they default on their credit. Uh, so the features are drawn from the internal operations of a financial institution, as well as the credit bureau. So there's like a natural vertical partition and that's why we chose this particular data set. The demo consists of three main sections. The first one is data preparation. The second is model preparation. And the last is training and validation. At a high level in the data preparation stage, we take the two data sets, one from home credit, one from credit bureau, and we compute the intersection uh, using private set intersection on the unique identifiers. And then we can um, order the data sets by the identifiers to make sure that we have valid correspondences between the data sets when we uh, define our full data set. In the model preparation stage, we're going to define a model for the credit bureau, a model for home credit, and um, a wrapper called the split neural network, which is going to orchestrate the flow of data and gradients across these submodules that are potentially on different machines. Um, so data is never explicitly shared, um, only representations of the data. So if we take a look at this within the context of um, our data set, we can define um, a split neural network, which consists of the green and the blue um, MLPs. And the green M, uh, MLP is going to input the credit bureau data and output an embedding, which is then concatenated to the home credit data, which is fed into the home credit model, which yields the final prediction. So by using a framework like this, even though we have features that are disjoint um, and we have to define the split neural network and, and just share representations of the data, we're still able to achieve a robust AUC um, on a validation set. So this is just AUC versus um, validation epoch. Moving on to the next demo, I'll just quickly discuss this one. It was on uh, private aggregation of teacher ensembles. Um, it's often called PATE. Um, so in private AI, there's things called privacy attacks where adversaries um, are basically trying to reveal information um, that was used to train a model. And these take a lot of different forms. Uh, one of the most popular ones is a membership inference attack where the adversary is trying to ascertain whether or not a sample was used to train a model. 
So to evaluate um, models robustness to privacy attacks, we need to um, define a quantitative framework um, that describes the model's performance in terms of privacy. And to this end, differential privacy has been proposed and offers uh, a powerful way to kind of assess the, the privacy of a model and compare it um, across different models. Um, and it does so based on the sensitivity of a model to the inclusion of a specific sample. So if we take a look at the figure, um, we could have a database um, that's full of um, records and basically um, for all D1 and D2, which are data sets that differ um, by one individual record in the data set, we want the model to produce roughly the same score. So this intuitively is basically we don't want the model's predictions to be too contingent on any one person's um, data, which, which makes sense. So in order to accomplish uh, differential privacy, there's been a lot of different techniques that have been proposed. Um, differentially private stochastic gradient descent is, is one that's uh, very popular and, and was a seminal paper, but it can only be applied to um, models that use uh, gradient-based optimization. Um, but PATE has been um, proposed as an ensemble-based method to achieve differential privacy, and it's actually independent of learning algorithms, so this is a really desirable trait. And at a high level, we have a, a data set of sensitive data that we partition into different partitions um, and train each uh, a, a teacher on, and basically um, we take this ensemble's uh, predict predictions and aggregate it in a noisy way. Um, and finally, we can define a student model that is trained on public features um, and gets the labels uh, from uh, the teacher ensemble. So this is a, a pretty complicated method and I, I get into the nitty gritty in the notebook, but at a high level, you can see why ensemble-based methods kind of implicitly enforce the assumption that we don't want to be contingent on one person's data by splitting the data into different partition and training different models. So um, we achieve good results um, using um, PATE. Um, the data set that we actually apply it to is also uh, the home credit data set, but this time we're not partitioning the features based on like credit bureau or home credit, we're just uh, considering the complete feature set and we really just want to um, train a model that's uh, differentially private. Uh, so with that being said, those were that was an overview of the, the two demos and some of the takeaways I had were, were um, at first, I, I really didn't have a lot of exposure to pets uh, prior to um, this boot camp, So it was a great learning experience for me. Um, and basically, it's interesting how it allows us to like democratize data. And I think it unlocks a lot of new uh, potential in domains where uh, data sets are like highly fragmented um, and contain sensitive information like in medical data. Um, I think we all know that it's an emerging field, but uh, tools are maturing fast. Uh, I just saw a couple of weeks ago, NVIDIA um, released uh, kind of uh, first version of a uh, federated learning uh, framework. So that's, I, I think, going to be super, super big for the community. Um, and also, just kind of an aside, it was awesome to see the high level of engagement from the boot camp participants, from the industry sponsors. Um, I think they're really excited about the technologies, and it, it seemed like a lot of people got um, a good outcome out of the boot camp. So I was, I was happy to hear that. Um, and yeah, with that said, I think I'll pass it to Sohan to kind of talk about his uh, demos um, for the Pets Bootcamp. Thanks, John. Sohan, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Sure. Thank you so much. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Uh, you may just want to put it in presenter mode, though. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, uh, 
Hello everyone, I'm Sopan. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, one of the projects that I have been working on uh, during the fall semester as an intern. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, specifically membership defense attacks and defenses. Uh, so here is like the table of the content of my presentation. Uh, uh, I'll talk about a little bit talk about the privacy enhancing techniques, pets, like the current solutions. I go over the like Explore a lot of topics that I've been working on during the internships and specifically the membership inference attack and defenses, which includes the definition, uh, some membership inference attack methods and defenses. Uh, I also uh, like uh, did some simulations using TensorFlow and TensorFlow privacy to benchmark some of the TensorFlow, some of the uh, TensorFlow privacy-based uh, membership inference attacks. Uh, and also like explored some like uh, possibilities uh, for improving robustness against this attack. So uh, we all know that uh, nowadays this is necessary to ensure that like an organization and the users they saw remain private uh, and secure. Uh, so like uh, recent pets uh, that like have been uh, emerged, uh, like include uh, homomorphic encryption, which kind of you transform your data to an encrypted uh, domain and then uh, design models that perform uh, on that model, uh, the other one is like federated learning, which focus on distributed or like decentralized learning why different organizations wants to collaborate each other uh, while they want to keep their data uh, in their organization. Uh, uh, the differential privacy, which provides us uh, a mathematical framework for quantifying uh, the privacy loss and also propose uh, robustness against adversary attacks. Uh, so during the internship, I have been working on horizontal federated learning. Uh, like I created demos on uh, real-world histopathology data sets, also uh, the training uh, birth model in a federated scheme. We also implemented federated learning from scratch. I also focused on membership inference attacks and uh, defenses, which will be focus of my presentation today. So. Let's go with definition. So membership inference attack on machine learning models aims to identify whether you have used a specific data point during the training or training your model or not. Or not. So uh, basically it tries to understand given the data point, this is a training data point or a testing data point uh, from a perspective. So uh, it's clear that the membership inference attack can raise severe privacy risks to individuals. For example, let's say we have a model that predict like uh, uh, like uh, predictions for the, uh, like rare cancer subtypes. Uh, so if attacker can like kind of decode that you are using which data points, it's kind of the attacker knows that those individuals or data points have that specific cancer. Uh, so in the literature, membership inference attack uh, like generally focus on deep learning models. This is due to the fact that uh, uh, membership inference attack target overfitting. Uh, like if your model is prone to overfit, overfitting, uh, the, your robustness will be degraded against the attack. And like during the presentation, I go over this, uh, why this thing is happening. Uh, so like in terms of the membership inference attack methods, uh, generally they are categorized in uh, two different categories, like black box and white box attacks. So uh, this categorization is based on the adversarial knowledge. So the adversarial knowledge itself uh, means like the data knowledge. So generally we assume that we know the distribution of data for this attack. The training knowledge, which means that we know which optimizer you are using, number of training steps, and et cetera. Uh, and the model knowledge, which means that you know the model architecture uh, or even model parameters. Uh, so the output knowledge means uh, like, uh, do you have access to the full output? Partial output uh, means like you have access to, for example, uh, labels or like predictions, confidence that uh, are noisy or like kind of a mask, have been masked, or you only have access to the label. Uh, in terms of attacks, uh, the attacks are categorized uh, in two categories, like learning-based attacks or neural network-based attacks in the literature, or threshold-based or uh, equivalently metric-based attacks. So uh, this table kind of shows uh, what's the difference between black box and white box attacks. So in uh, like uh, 
uh, white box attacks. In black box attacks, you do have access to data knowledge, training knowledge, and output knowledge. But in white box attacks, uh, additionally, you do have access to model architecture and model parameters. So you can uh, kind of have access to the model, get the intermediate, for example, activation functions, values, uh, and uh, parameter values uh, for a specific inference or prediction. So for learning-based uh, membership inference attacks, generally the attacker is a binary classifier, uh, which takes the prediction of, of your model and tries to decode uh, uh, whether you have used this uh, specific data point uh, during the training or not. To do this generally, having this mind that we have access to the data distribution and like model architecture, we create some uh, shadow models and shadow data set for ourselves and uh, train these shadow models and shadow data sets. And like specifically these shadow models try to uh, create some training data for us where the training data like, is couple of, for example, like predictions, uh, and like it can be like confidence scores, just labels, uh, and having these predictions, uh, given that we know that these predictions uh, are like some of them have been used for training these shadow models and some of them have not been used for training these shadow models, we can generate a uh, training data for the attacker and use that training data uh, uh, hoping that training data is mimicking the behavior of the real model which we do not have access to. Using that training data, we can train or attack and, and do the uh, learning-based uh, membership inference attack. The other kind of the attack is metric-based attack, which generally like you measure a metric, which can be like prediction correctness, prediction loss, prediction confidence, or prediction entropy. For example, the prediction correctness, which is like the baseline method says, okay, if you are using, if you are predicting this uh, label correctly, it means that you have used this model, you have used this data for your training. And uh, I say, okay, this is a like a member at a data point. Or if you are mispredicting this data point, that this attacker says this is, you have not used this data point. Uh, like for the prediction confidence, for, uh, just for an, another example, it's like if you are too confident about this prediction, like you are, as far as like, uh, 0 0.999 and the other like close to zero, I would say this is a, a data point that you have used during the training. And like similar reasoning uh, will be used for the other metrics. So in terms of differences against the membership inference attack, uh, some of the proposed uh, differences in the literature are confidence as for Maslick, regularization, uh, differential privacy, uh, and like any approach that uh, improves uh, uh, generalization. So um uh so like if we just think about like membership inference attack as i said it tries to reveal that if a data point has been used during the training or not so intuitively if our model behaves similar during for on uh, both training and test data set so if the behavior of your model is similar for test and training data set which means what which means your your generalization is good because you are model is behaving similar on training and test set. So your generalization is good. Then this is difficult for the attacker to do membership inference attack on your model. Or in other words, your model is more robust against the attack. So any method like dropout, weight regularization, DPSGD, uh, like they are kind of like uh, helpful for the attack. But the DPSGD as a differential private algorithm uh, is also like helpful for the other attackers and ha like has other characteristics. Well, I'm also here talking about another method called SAM here, which means sharpness ever minimization, which is like the main focus of my presentation. I have uh, explored the potential of this optimizer, which is a new optimizer for uh, improving generalization uh, in terms of improving robustness against that. Like, so like in a nutshell, sharpness ever minimization or SAM uh, tries to find a local minima, which is like, uh, has minimum sharpness or it's flat. So you, you can think of it like in terms, instead of just finding a local minima, we find the local minima that the loss value for a neighborhood uh, is low, uh, rather than just for one specific point. So the, like, there are both uh, intuitive and theoretical connection, uh, like intuitions, why this thing should improve the membership inference, robustness against membership inference. Effect. So generally, just to go over the method, the sharpness event minimization 
says that uh, the loss function over D, which is like over the population data set, uh, it has an upper bound uh, like this. And they show that this upper bound, uh, which is like a regular loss function over training data set as that we have, which has been preterm and a weight decay term. They said that, okay, just to make it explicit, if you minus a loss function over training data set and add this term, just to show how this thing works, then minimizing this loss function, which is the upper bound of the loss function over the population data. It says that you are minimizing the sharpness of your loss function, you are minimizing the standard loss function and also adding a weight decay. So minimizing this loss function is equivalent to simultaneously reducing the sharpness of your loss function and like uh, also the regular loss function. Uh, so they so they end up with this formulation, like the algorithm is fa like fairly easy. They said that in order to do sharpness every minimization, all you want to do is just do uh, regular like back propagation, just take derivative, the, calculate the gradients of your loss function, then calculate the, this preterivation that maximize sharpness. So this is the formula that they found for calculating the preterivation, which is function of the gradient. Uh, and then uh, uh, in order to calculate the loss function of your sharpness event minimizer, all you need is to calculate the gradient of the preterived loss function. So basically, all you need is to is to in each epoch you calculate a preterivation uh, and like preterm your loss function and calculate the gradient. But you should know that this preterivation is also a function of gradient. So by using this algorithm, you kind of uh, converge to a flat local minima, uh, which kind of I guess has connection to like differential privacy, uh, which I will discuss just in the following. So like uh, for the result section, uh, like I have benchmarked different uh, available attacks in TensorFlow privacy, threshold attack, entropy attack, uh, KNN attack, and the other attacks. Uh, and I also like uh, try to defend against these attackers using DPSGD, which basically clip the norm and add noise, and also sharpness aware minimization. Uh, which I, which has been like proposed uh, just recently for the generalization. So like, if you think of it, like we have a connection between like the amount of the noise that you add is equivalent to like the sensitivity of your function. This is like for from differential privacy, uh, sensitivity divided by the noise. So the more noise you add, uh, like it's like you have less information leakage and also like the less sensitivity that you have because it's in, non in the nominator. Uh, it's like the most, uh, the less uh, sensitivity that you have, uh, uh, you, uh, you, you have less information leakage. So I was interpreting that the sensitivity in the like differential privacy literature is kind of similar to the flatness because like sensitivity and sharpness are kind of similar. So that's what like one other intuition that I thought this method could be helpful against uh, membership for this attack. So I benchmark different methods, uh, like different attacks. Here you can see like threshold attack, uh, threshold entropy attack, and the other attacks. So as you can see, logistic regression and MLP-based attacks are kind of works better here. Are the area under curve of the attack for correctly classified data points and incorrectly classified data points. As you can see, when it comes to incorrectly classified data points, which are generally data points that we are not generalizing well, the attacker is like much more successful. So here is another intuition that shows that if your model doesn't generalize well, the, attack, the attacker would be more successful because like here on the split of the incorrectly data classified, uh, the attacker is achieving by, achieving by far better accuracy. So here, uh, like I use just a regular SGD and I use these attacks and calculate the area on the curve of the attacker or different attackers on the CIFAR data set. Uh, so I try to, and now I try to defend this attack. I used regular SGD. Here you can see the AUC curve of the regular SGD. This is the DP SGD. And the other one is sharpness aware minimization. Uh, so the second row also shows the uh, classification accuracy for testing and training. So as you can see, for example, for regular training, uh, so the classification accuracy, uh, like training accuracy is too high, but for testing is uh, like around 667, uh, but the attacker is quite successful. He is actually like the attacker is achieving 83 area on the curve. For the DPSGD, the robustness is very good. So it's almost close to chance is 55, but uh, the, uh, the test accuracy like has been degraded. 
to 62. The sharpness ever minimizer uh, kind of achieve kind of similar uh, robustness in, against the attack, but uh, the testing accuracy also has been improved. So the sharpness ever minimizer not only improve the utility, but also try to provoke, propose a good robustness against the attack yeah, in comparison with the DPSGD. So uh, this is like the last slide, uh, which shows like the robustness of the learning algorithm against like exclusion of data points. So for example, for the uh, blue bar plot, I have excluded one data point and retrained the model. Uh, so with SGD, DPSGD and SAM, I did this experiment with like excluding two data points for red and 10 data points for green. So as you can see, the SGD is quite like the, uh, the difference between the uh, train rates uh, after uh, excluding data points is much higher compared to DPSGD and SAP. So in a nutshell, I guess like DPSGD is more powerful in terms of improving robustness, but it also degrade the utility or performance of your model uh, significantly. While SAM is kind of a trade-off uh, uh, that improve the utility and also in, uh, improve the robustness against this attack. So I guess uh, this is the end of my presentation. And here are like the references that I've used for this presentation. Thank you.